Hello, my name is Tony. <coughs> ah, that's better. Cleared the old tubes. Tarzan's Greatest Adventure is my favourite Tarzan film. Wayne McAuliffe mentioned it in one of his comments, and coincidentally cited it the same for him. Doesn't take much to set me off on a particular course of action, it would seem, but as always, there's more going on here than meets the eye. As a kid, Tarzan flicks were staple viewing during school holidays. Christmas, Easter, summer, truant in season, which lasted most of the year. BBC used to screen the old Johnny Weissmuller ones in the mornings, and sometimes the later ones from the 50s and 60s, initially featuring Lex Barker, then Gordon Scott, and latterly Jock Mahoney and Mike Henry. This one hails from 1959. Between 1955 and 1960, Scott played the role in six movies, Greatest Adventure being his penultimate appearance. He was in the first Tarzan film to be made in colour. Once he was done with the franchise after Tarzan the Magnificent in 1960, he spent the rest of the decade making sword and sandal epics in Italy. Well, it's a living. What is it about Greatest Adventure I found to be so appealing? Well, there are multitudes, or at least a few things. It was a turning point for both a stagnant franchise and the character. In cleaving closer to Rice Burroughs' novels and stories, adult Tarzan is a literate-sounding, well-spoken chap, no longer trading in the ersatz pigeon English of all the previous incarnations. He no longer presents as thick-tongued and illiterate, and is all the better for it, because now he seems like someone who has a function in intellect. Tarzan could communicate with animals, using what one might term a high-concept language, where the utility of a single word had multiple meanings. The word was Umgawa. Fetch me a banana. Umgawa. Pull on that rope, Jumbo. Umgawa. Fuck off, crocodile. Umgawa. Turn around and bend over, Jane. Daddy's coming home. Umgawa. Not anymore. Scott's jungle jockey is no Dr. Doolittle. Neither is he the physically impervious hero of the past. We see he can be damaged, seriously wounded, badly hurt. There's that added tension and edge of uncertainty as to just how successful he's going to be, how things will play out. Also, the comedy chimp only has a walk-on part early doors, and there are no Jane or boy characters to clutter up the narrative. It's a stripped-back affair. Tarzan is now more of a troubleshooting action hero, a taciturn loner, a man capable of being just as savage and ruthless as his opponents when needs be. You have a slicker, contemporary temporary action adventure with a more developed and human central character. And Scott, never the most expressive or impressive of actors, and I don't say that in a mean way, does in fairness extend his range and hands in a decent piece of work. Part of it was filmed on location in Kenya, providing immersive location backdrops for a pinch of added realism. The studio bound bits were wrapped up at Shepparton in the UK. The director was one John Gwillimin, a safe pair of hands who would go on to helm the Blue Man the undervalued war pick, the bridge at Romagan, and the towering inferno. Stylistically, he was fond of using handheld cameras at key moments to infuse a little snap and crackle into his takes. He had a good sense of the relationship between characters and environments, which is critical in shooting action sequences. He's credited with co-writing the script with TV hack Bernie Geiler from a story by another TV hack, Les Crutchfield. Crutchfield, to his credit, did provide the basis for the John Sturges direct Kirk Douglas Anthony Quinn psychological western last train from Gun Hill, a classy little number to have on a resume. And get this, cinematography is by Edward Scaife, The Third Man, The Dirty Dozen, and Ollie Reed's wonderful sit-in target. Some whip-smart credentials there, alrighty. Apart from Scott as Tarzan, we get lauded British character actor, theatre director, and novelist Anthony Quayle as the head villain Slade. Sketchy but super cute Sarah Shane as the woman in peril who thankfully turns out to be more of a help than a hindrance. It was her last feature film appearance. Quail's henchman O'Banion is played by a little-known no-hoper on a one-way ticket to Nowheresville, going by the name of Sean Connery. Wonder what ever became of him? Niall McGuinness is Quail's evil ex-Nazi partner in crime, Kreigler. McGuinness had a career that in total embraced over 80 screen appearances. The final heavy is Dino, played by Al Mullock, whose last screen role was as one of Henry Fonda's gang in Once Upon a Time in the West. Slade's girlfriend Tony is played by sultry Italian actress Scylla Gabelle, and very chic and decorative she is too. At heart, Tarzan's greatest adventure is a pursuit flick with pits 
stops along the way. Slade Quail is an old nemesis of Tarzan. Disguised as natives, he and his gang raid an African village to steal some dynamite, in the process killing a doctor and a radio operator. The radio guy manages to send out a distress call before dying, giving Slade's name. Slade and his goons take off on a riverboat. They head into a secret diamond mine where they intend to use the dynamite to gain access to the gems. Alerted by jungle drums, Tarzan Scott abandons his treehouse and monkey to get to the village where the funerals of those murdered are taking place. A police inspector fills him in on events. Footloose fashion model Angie Sarah Shane has landed there in her Playboy Paramore's light aircraft. She picked up the transmission implicated Slade in the theft and murder. Tarzan chases after Slade and his gang in a canoe. As fate would have it, Angie happens by flying overhead in her plane. She decides to buzz Tarzan in his canoe, just for a laugh. Her merriment is short-lived as the plane engine cuts out and she crashes into the river. Despite the diversion, Tarzan goes to rescue her from a hungry crocodile and elects to drag her along with him as he can't spare the time to return her to safety. The thieves are an untrustworthy and cutthroat bunch with a lead who is quite mentally unstable. They don't rub along too sympathetically. Towards the end, with Dino drowning in quicksand, Tarzan taking O'Banion out with an arrow, and Tony falling into a pit full of sharpened wooden stakes, a trap Slade had laid for Tarzan, only Slade and Kreigler remain. In the mine, it becomes apparent that Slade's overriding objective has shifted from obtaining the diamonds to an obsession with killing Tarzan. He's fashioned a wire garrote and pole device for this purpose. It saves his life when Kreigler shoves him into a bottomless shaft, and he's able to climb out and shove Kreigler's ass down there instead. Slade is going quickly off his rocker. The scene is set for a one-to-one -one confrontation between a wounded Tarzan, he was blown up with a stick of jelly, and Slade on a perilous clifftop overlooking the river. Who's your money on, ape man or criminal nut bar? Tarzan's greatest adventure is a vibrant, zingy little slab of rumble in the jungle hokum. Yeah, I know, today it looks primitive and crude, with jittery, unconvincing back projection, cheap studio sets, and low-rent B-movie dialogue. But the enthusiasm, fun, and economy with which it is made are saving graces, and some of the location scenery is impressively striking. Plus, the refocusing of the character is a major bonus. It's something of a revenge odyssey, Tarzan and Slade of a history, and Tarzan is quite definitive that his aim is to kill Slade, and Slade certainly wants to kill Tarzan. It has a tougher edge, a little more grit. The action, too, takes no prisoners, and without being visually explicit, is strongly suggesting of gruesome and sticky ends for some of the characters. People are seen to bleed, especially Tarzan, whose side wound from the dynamite attack lays him significantly low, at which point Angie proves her worth by taking care of him. Her hair and makeup are miraculously back in place as if she's just stepped out of the salon. Suppose a girl has to make an effort even in the jungle. The romantic subtext between the two is very conveniently underwritten so that it doesn't get in the way or slow the pace. The final beat-em-up between Tarzan and Slade is pretty vicious and grueling, a punishing battle well coordinated with rapid switches in who has the upper hand to raise the tension level. Naturally, the outcome is a crowd pleaser with only the merest hint of pathos as Angie sails away on the riverboat and Tarzan returns to the jungle. For the briefest of moments, there is a hint he might go after her. But as he earlier pointed out, this is where he belongs, so he doesn't. So there. Connery displays powerful glimmers of the star quality simmering away in his persona, soon to be writ large with his debut as Bond in Dr. No. Quail is nicely disturbed and disturbing as the bad guy, and McGuinness impresses as a sleazy, sweaty Nazi creep who matches him in the wacky, depraved villainy stakes. It's no cinematic masterpiece, that's for sure, but it does what it sets out to do, captivate and entertain whilst tweaking a classic literary and movie hero to return him to his roots and fortuitously update him in the process. Like I said, it's my favourite Tarzan movie, with a Tarzan who never looked more virile and powerful. No homoerotic undertone intended, gays, or uh, guys. Innocent, unpretentious, boy's own entertainment at its best, which is good enough for me, pilgrims. Thank you for your time time and attention. Do whatever you want to do. Hit like, don't like, comment, subscribe, be a patron of my Patreon thing, make a financial contribution to keep the wheels turning fractionally, and provide me with some coin for my rehab fund. I shall return soon. No idle threat, that.